Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Abraham Lincoln, Part 7, elected 16th U.S. President in 1860. We stopped last time in 1859. Abraham Lincoln was nationally known because of his debates with Stephen Douglas in the race for U.S. Senate Senator in Illinois. And uh, they, the debates uh, focused the nation's attention on the issue of slavery. Now, an interesting thing, in 1859, in the summer and fall of that year, there was a 35-year-old French acrobat named Charles Blondin, uh, who was a tight... He, he was he, he was a tightrope walker, and he walked on a tightrope across Niagara Falls many times. Uh, just incredible information. He was uh, the rope sagged 60 feet in the middle. He had a balancing bar. He did all kinds of things on these different uh, tr- walks he took across on this uh, high high wire. He did tricks. He did a somersault, he did a flip headstand, monkey crawl, he balanced on a chair, he walked backwards, he did it at night, he walked blindfolded <laughs> in chains, uh, he also did it on forefoot stilts, this stuff is, is just beyond belief, but this is the recorded history. He actually uh, at one point had a stove in a wheelbarrow that he brought out, he cooked an omelet uh, on the wire and lowered the lowered the, the egg, the food, down to passengers in the maid of the mist uh, uh, bo- uh, boat below. Just an incredible story. We'll have a reference to that later. Abraham Lincoln felt like that during the Civil War, felt like this uh, tightrope walker. Now, the Ohio Republican Convention in 1859 was on June 2nd. They, the platform included a call for the, a repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law. In 1859, Abraham Lincoln expanded his national influence through public speaking. He spoke in five states, Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Kansas. In September, Abraham and his wife Mary boarded a train for Columbus, Ohio, where he gave a speech. And Lincoln said, quote, What is Stephen Douglas's popular sovereignty? It is, as a principle, no other than that if one man chooses to make a slave of another man, neither that man nor anybody else has a right to object. He gave two dozen speeches in Iowa, Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Kansas from four months between August and December of 1859. One of, in one of the speeches, Abraham Lincoln said, quote, I am what they call, as I understand it, a black Republican. I think slavery is wrong, morally and politically. I desire that it should be no further spread in these United States, and I should not object if it should gradually terminate in the whole Union. Now, he made a reference to the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which forbids slavery in the Northwest Territory. Of course, then that had been violated by the Kansas-Nebraska Act which opened up the possibility of slavery in the Northwest. Another speech, Abraham Lincoln said, quote, Do not misunderstand me as saying Illinois must have an extreme anti-slavery candidate. I do not so mean. We must, we must have, though, a man who recognizes the slavery issue as being the living issue of the day, who does not hesitate to declare slavery a wrong, nor to deal with it as such who believes in the power and duty of Congress to prevent the spread of it. October of 1859, Abraham Lincoln received a letter uh, inviting him to speak at a Brooklyn, New York uh, City church in November, and they offered to pay him $200, and he could talk on any topic. topic. On October 16th, John Brown, a 59-year-old abolitionist, and a band of 21 men raided the U.S. arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Their plan was to confiscate all the weapons and distribute those to slaves and start a slave rebellion. There was a a 36-hour standoff before Brown and his supporters surrendered. Now, this became a very uh, dramatic, controversial act. His actions were popular in the North. However, the South was frightened and furious about what, what happened, and especially also about the reaction in the North. 
Abraham Lincoln's reaction was that it was, it was a violation of law and futile in terms of its effect, quote, on the extinction of a great evil. Now, eventually, uh, uh, John Brown was, uh, was arrested and tried and uh, sentenced to death, uh, convicted and sentenced to death for his actions, and, uh, res- and was executed. And at his execution, uh, John Wilkes Booth was a witness of course, Booth was considered or believed to be the, uh, was, well, actually, Booth did shoot and kill uh, Abraham Lincoln in, in 1865. Now, the reactions to John Brown's actions, uh, Henry David Thoreau, the famous philosopher, compared John Brown to Jesus Christ. Another philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson, called Brown a saint. A, a, poem, a, a song was composed called John Brown's Body, and it became a popular Union Army marching song during the Civil War. Biogra- Lincoln biographer Stephen B. Oates wrote, quote, The Republican Party and John Brown-style revolutionary violence were forged like a ring of steel in the Southern mind. So this was one more step in leading to the Civil War and in increasing the hostility between North and South. In December of 1859, Chicago was chosen as the site for the 1860 Republican National Convention, and Abraham Lincoln was a strong candidate to become uh, the nominee for president for the Republicans. He decided it was time to write a short autobiography, and he wrote, quote, I was born February 12, 1809 in Hardin County, Kentucky. My parents were both born in Virginia of undistinguished families. My paternal grandfather was killed by Indians. My father, at the death of his father, was but six years of age. It was a wild region where I grew up. There were some schools so-called. There was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education. If a straggler happened to understand Latin, happened to sojourn in the neighborhood... He was looked upon as a wizard. January of 1860, there was uh, more talk of uh, Abraham Lincoln being nominated by the Republican Party for president. February 16th, the Chicago Press endorsed, quote, the nomination of Abraham Lincoln for the first place on the national Republican ticket. In February, Lincoln uh, traveled to New York City to give speeches. He attended church in Brooklyn Heights and heard a lecture by Henry Ward Beecher. He had his photograph taken at that time. The photo- photographer asked him asked to adjust Abraham Lincoln's tie, and Lincoln responded, quote, and he said, quote, Ah, I see you want to shorten my neck. So Abraham Lincoln gave a speech at the Cooper Union on 7th Street between 3rd and 4th Avenues in New York City. Charles C. Knott described uh, Lincoln at that time, quote, The first impression of the man from the West did nothing to contradict the expectation of something weird, rough, and uncultivated. The long, ungainly figure upon which hung clothes that, while new for the trip, were evidently the work of an unskillful tailor. The large feet, the clumsy hands of which, at the outset at least, the orator seemed to be unduly conscious. The long, gaunt head, capped by a shock of hair, that seemed not to have been thoroughly brushed out, made a picture which did not fit with New York's conception of a Finnish statesman. Now, in, in Lincoln's speech at that, at that night, he talked about the signers of the Constitution, which was ratified in 1787, written and ratified. There were 39 men, and uh, in, the, in the years after that, in legislative votes regarding the expansion of slavery into the territories from 1784 to 1820, uh, 23 of these uh, signers were in Congress, and 21 of them voted uh, that the federal government had the right to exercise power over slavery in the territories. Abraham Lincoln said in this speech, quote, One of the reasons why I am opposed to slavery is just here. What is the true condition of the laborer? I want every man to have the chance, and I believe a black man is entitled to it, in which he can better his condition, when he may look forward and hope to be a hired laborer this year and the next work for himself, afterward, and finally to hire men to work for him. 
Biographer Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote, quote, Though Abraham Lincoln desired success as fiercely as any of his rivals, he did not allow his quest for office to consume the kindness and open-heartedness with which he treated supporters and rivals alike, nor alter his steady commitment to the anti-slavery cause. In February, uh, Lincoln was in continued in New York City and was giving speech, these speeches, uh, William Lee Miller wrote, quote, The way Abraham Lincoln won over his audience was not by oratorical eloquence, eloquence, elegance, but by sheer preparation and relentless clarity. So he talked about a, a lot about how the founding fathers were against the extension of slavery into the Northwest Territory. And he had evidence, solid evidence based on their voting record. In the speech, Lincoln said, quote, Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. After his, this Cooper Union speech, which was received very enthusiastically, Lincoln accepted a request to speak in three New England states. And uh, during that time, he visited his son Robert, who was a student at Phillips Exeter Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire. Lincoln was very proud of Robert, although he never had the same bond that he had with Tad and Willie. There was a distance between the father and the son. Robert had applied to Harvard and had been rejected, uh, and he was humiliated over that. But eventually, after his studying at this Phillips Exeter Academy, he did was accepted at Harvard when he applied again and studied and graduated at Harvard. In March, there was a shoemaker's strike in New England, or a series of strikes. Abraham Lincoln said, quote, I am glad to know that there is a system of labor where the laborer can strike if he wants to. I would to God that such a system prevailed all over the world. So after his uh, time in, in the East, in uh, New York and New England, he returned to Springfield, Illinois, and Ronald C. White Jr. wrote, quote, it was as if the affirmation he had received in New York and New England finally convinced a cautious Abraham Lincoln that he had the support to seek the highest office in the land. His law partner, William Herndon, wrote, quote, It was apparent now to, to Lincoln that the Republican presidential nomination was within reach. His, when he got home to Springfield, Illinois, his friends congratulated him on his success in the East. Now, the Democratic Convention had their, uh, uh, they had their convention in Charleston, South Carolina in, on April 23rd. That's when it started. After 10 days and 57 ballots, they had no consensus on a pr candidate for president. Their party was dividing. And so they, they uh, ceased the convention on May 3rd, agreed to meet six weeks later in Baltimore, Maryland, and try again to come up with a c candidate. Now, with the Republicans, and with Lincoln specifically, David Davis, uh, a, who was Lincoln's friend a, that he met as, who was a judge, became uh, Lincoln's campaign manager. May of 1860, in, in Decatur, Illinois, the Illinois State Republican Convention was held. Now, in the 19th century, there were many uh, colorful political nicknames like Old Hickory for Andrew Johnson in 1828, Tippecanoe and Tyler, too, in 1840 for the uh, William Henry Harrison campaign. The Pathfinder for John C. Fremont in 1856. And in 1860, Abraham Lincoln's uh, nicknames became Old Abe and the Rail Splitter. The Republican National Convention in 1860 was in Chicago, Illinois, in May, and the population of Chicago at that time was 100,000 people. Abraham Lincoln did not attend. It was not considered proper, so he stayed back in Springfield, splitting his time between the law office and the telegraph office. He was checking the news from the convention. The platform at the convention they came up with was against the extension of slavery into the territories. It was in favor of the Homestead Act, a land for poor people, uh, free land in the West, and uh, federal support to build a railroad to the Pacific Coast. And uh, Abraham Lincoln was nominated for president on the third ballot. So he got the nomination, and uh, he received the news in Springfield. He went to the telegraph office at one point and got the news, and he, he said to a gr group of his friends there, quote, 
Well, gentlemen, there is a little woman who is probably more interested in this dispatch than I am. So he's talking, so he's going home to tell his wife Mary the good news. On May 18th, there was a rally at the State House in Springfield uh, in celebration. A large parade uh, took place to, that le- leading to Abraham Lincoln's home, and he was serenaded by this crowd. Lincoln came out and spoke, and he said he, quote, did not suppose the honor of such a visit was intended particularly for himself, a private citizen, but rather the, represent- the representative of a great party. Now, his running mate that was agreed upon was Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. One of the, uh, now, of course, the criticism is a big part of politics, and Lincoln, uh, one of the things that was said is that Abraham Lincoln was a nullity. The New York Tribune responded to that criticism, quote, A man who by his own genius and force of character has raised himself from being a penniless and uneducated flat boatman on the Wabash River to the position Mr. Lincoln now occupies is not likely to be a nullity anywhere. I think a nullity is just you're you're nothing, a nullity. Well, Abraham Lincoln was definitely something, someone. So another speech by Abraham Lincoln, quote, Nobody has ever expected me to be president. In my poor, lean, lank face, nobody has ever seen that any cabbages were sprouting out. We have to fight this battle upon principle and upon principle alone. Now, the campaign strategy, uh, uh, it, it was decided that to stress uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, humble origins, his humble beginnings, of course, this would compel, appeal to most people who were also, you know, the common man. Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote, quote, Although his grim beginnings held no fascination for him, Abraham Lincoln was astute enough to capitalize upon this invaluable political asset. A delegation of uh, Republican Party insiders visited Abraham Lincoln at his home home shortly after he, he received the nomination, and then Abraham and Mary had a disagreement on whether or not they should serve alcohol. Uh, Mary wanted to, she thought that was hospitable, but uh, Abraham prevailed in, 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 in respect for the temperance movement and ice water was, res- was served to his guests. One of the irony in the 1860 campaign is a Lincoln had to st- stayed home more than ever before because the custom at that time and previously and for some time to come was for the uh, politi- uh, was for the uh, uh, candidates to, to, to not campaign. Thur- Thurlow Weed, a politician of that time, re- said that Abraham Lincoln revealed, quote, such intuitive knowledge of human nature and such familiarity with the virtues and infirmities of politicians that I became impressed very favorably with his fitness for the duties which he was not unlikely to be called upon to discharge. Lincoln wrote a letter to Salmon, Salmon, or Salmon P. Chase, one of his rivals, one of his defeated rivals, for the nomination, and he wrote, quote, Holding myself the humblest of all whose names were before the convention, I feel in a special need of the assistance of all. So he was reaching out to his rivals. Now, the Democrats were dividing. They, they ended up with three candidates for president, John Bell, Stephen Douglas, and John C. Breckinridge. And this really meant that uh, Lincoln was probably going to win. And he said, quote, I think the chances were more than equal that we could have beaten the Democrats united. Divided as it is, its chance appears indeed very slim. John L. Scripps of the Chicago Tribune wrote in his campaign biography of Abraham Lincoln that Lincoln had read Plutarch, which was uh, an ancient uh, Roman uh, um, uh, author. And on second thought, he became worried, and Scripps uh, wrote to Lincoln and suggested that Lincoln get a copy of Plutarch and read it so that the report would become true. He wasn't sure if that was true. Now, Lincoln thought that was pretty funny, so he did get a copy of Plutarch and read this ancient Roman uh, uh, writings. So that, that worked out fine. Now, John G. Nicoli, Nicoli became uh, Lincoln's one-man staff, and well, he was, uh, I believe, a law clerk, law student, and so he worked and helped in the campaign and eventually in the White House. 
And John John Nicolay was a very important help during, for Lincoln at this time and in his presidency. Nicolay Nicolay loved words. He loved the Bible. He loved William Shakespeare and political editorials. Lincoln and Nicolay had mutual trust and appreciation. Um, now uh, Lincoln had become a celebrity. There was an army of politicians, reporters, photographers, portrait painters arriving in Springfield. However, this elevated status did little to change his personal habits and his relationships with people. He did not change. He remained a humble man. He did not become arrogant. Mary was eager to join the campaign. She had a passion for politics, Lincoln's wife, and she had long recognized her husband's abilities, and she had long believed that her husband, Abraham, was destined to become American president. Mary became a consultant for a Lincoln, not about issues, but about people. She, could, uh, she would say, well, this is a good guy or a bad guy. And she believed uh, her husband was too trusting. From May, to, from May to November of 1860, Mary was with Abraham every day. So they were together a lot, and she expressed her opinions and was his chief advisor. This was the longest time they ever spent together. In June of 1860, Frederick, Frederick Douglass, the... Uh, African-American spokesperson, leader of black Americans, praised Abraham Lincoln as, quote, a man of unblemished private character, a lawyer standing near the front rank of the bar of his own state, has a cool and well-balanced head, a great firmness of will, is perseveringly industrious, and one of, and one of the most frank, honest men in political life. The political campaigns at that time were the chief entertainment of the day, of course, without uh, TV, movies, radio, internet. So they had, uh, people had a lot of fun during presidential campaigns with rallies, parades, poll raisings, picnics, fireworks, excursions, illuminations, and riots. Uh, similar uh, to the early 19th century religious revivals and 20th century spectator sports. Uh, the speeches that were made uh, promoted Abraham Lincoln, emphasized his humble origins, a man of the people, and women at, at the Lincoln political rallies uh, had banners which wrote, quote, Westward the star of empire takes its way. We link on to Lincoln as our mothers did to Clay. As I mentioned Henry, reference to Henry Clay. 1860 was the first time the elephant was used as a symbol for the Republican Party. Edward Baker, an old friend of Lincoln, wrote a letter to him, and he said, quote, The reward that fidelity and courage find in your person will infuse hope in many sinking bosoms and new energy in many bold hearts. That fall, there was talk of, a lot of talk of secession in the south of the southern states in response to Lincoln's, uh, if Lincoln won, they would pull out of the Union. Uh, now, Lincoln was confident as a son of the South. He was from, originally from Kentucky. He believed he understood the mind of the Southern people. In his record, he promised not to touch slavery in the South, so he didn't really believe this talk that the South would secede. In August of 1860, Abraham Lincoln said, quote, The people of the South have too much good sense and good temper to attempt the ruin of the government. Of course, that was a miscalculation. The summer and fall, there was a foreboding spirit in the South, and Lincoln was isolated from secessionist talk. There was a belief among Southerners that Lincoln was secretly aligned with abolitionists and ready to unleash slave rebellions in the South. Not true, but that's apparently what they believed. In 1858, Stephen Douglas had accused Lincoln of favoring Negro equality, which apparently... Which at that time was uh, an unacceptable popular belief in the South. Now, Douglas was a candidate, one of the three Democratic candidates, and he did campaign, and uh, he, made a, he violated that rule and was going all over the place making speeches. Abraham Lincoln's name did not appear on the ballot in 10 states in the South. Shows how, how anti-Republican Party and anti-Lincoln they were. And so, obviously, he couldn't win those states. And Lincoln was burned in effigy in public squares in the South. November 6th was Election Day, and uh, Lincoln had never voted for himself in any election, and he had no plans to do so, and apparently did not vote for himself. But he did vote. In the afternoon, he went to the courthouse and in Springfield. 
Uh, the results were coming in by telegraph. This is the beginning of the communications revolution. Shortly after midnight, the news came that Abraham Lincoln had been elected as the 16th U.S. president. He faced a problem that no other president had faced, how to preserve the Union, how to keep these southern states from pulling out and leaving the country, becoming independent. He did not, Lincoln still did not understand the very real possibilities of secession and war. He remained optimistic. On the morning after his election, I, he spoke to some newspaper men and said, quote, Well, boys, your troubles are over now. Mine have just begun. Lincoln continued and said, quote, I then felt I never I then felt I never had before the responsibility that was upon me. I began at once to feel that I needed support, others to share with me the bur- this burden. Now, he, he was uh, immediately thinking about his cabinet and the, the possible men that he might ask included Gideon Wells of Contet- Connecticut, William Seward of New York, William Dayton of New Jersey, Norman Judd of Illinois, Sam and Chase of Ohio, Edward Bates of Missouri, and Montgomery Blair of Maryland. Now, in the Electoral College in the election, uh, Lincoln received 180 electoral votes, John C. Breckinridge, 72, John Bell, 39, and Stephen Douglas, 12. So even though Stephen Douglas had won the Senate race two years before, but he finished uh, way back in the election. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was the, became the first Republican president. He received 40 million votes, and of course, the other, actually the other three candidates received 41 million, so he had, he had less than the majority. Lincoln did not win a single southern state. There was a four-month transition to his inauguration scheduled for March 4th of 1861, uh, the uh, now eventually years later, the inauguration was moved to January twentieth, nineteen thirty-seven, for and Franklin D. Roosevelt was the first to be inaugurated er- earlier, and we still have that tradition, shortening that time span. Uh, Lincoln used the governor's room on the second floor of the state house as his office. He also began to grow a beard. He'd received a letter from an 11-year-old girl named Grace Bedell in Westfield, New York, on October 15th, urging Lincoln to grow a beard. And she wrote, quote, You would look a great deal better, for your face is so thin. All the ladies like whiskers, and they would tease their husbands to vote for you, and then you would be president. And he, he grew a beard, and he became he kept that beard for the rest of his life. Uh, the, uh, and, and, of course, is well known for it now, his appearance as we're sporting a beard. Henry Villard of the New York Tribune wrote, quote, Abraham Lincoln is the very embodiment of good temper and affability. They will all conclu- can see that he has a kind word, an encouraging smile, a humorous remark for nearly everyone that seeks his presence. Now, Lincoln refused to compromise on the issue of the extension of slavery. He said, quote, Lincoln said, quote, there must be, quote, no compromise on the question of extending slavery. If there be, all our labor is lost. Stand firm. The tug has to come and better now than any time hereafter. So uh, after the election, Lincoln was greeting friends, politicians, reporters, and visitors in his office. His schedule, he would do that from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Then he went home for lunch. In the afternoon, he had open house from 3 o'clock to 5.30 p.m. Henry Villard of the New York Herald had wrote this about Abraham Lincoln, quote, He sits or stands among his guests, throwing out hearty Western welcomes, asking and answering questions joking, endeavoring to make matters every way comfortable to all present. He is precisely the same man as before, open and generous in his personal communications with all who approach him. Lincoln believed that the secessionists, those who wanted to pull out of the, the country in the South, represented a tiny minority. On November 21st, uh, Lincoln left Springfield for the first time in six months for a three-day meeting with Vice President-elect Vice President Hannibal Hamlin and others in Chicago. On December 22nd, uh, Lincoln said, quote, 
Do the people of the South really entertain fears that a Republican administration would directly or indirectly interfere with their slaves or with them about their slaves? If they do, I wish to assure you as once a friend, and still I hope hope not an enemy, that there is no cause for such fears. You think slavery is right and ought to be extended. Well, I think it is wrong and ought to be restricted. That, I suppose, is the rub. Thurlow Weed, a New York politician, wrote, quote, about Lincoln. Quote, while Mr. Lincoln never underestimates the difficulties which surround him, his nature was so elastic and his temperament so cheerful that he always seemed at ease and undisturbed. Well, that concludes today's presentation. Next time we'll continue with part eight of the life of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, yeah, I hope you have a nice history book to read. There are so many amazing history books out there. Uh, you might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History, with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. So far, we've made 721 history videos in eight areas. World history, American history, book reviews, poetic tours, Cleveland baseball, family history, and autobiography. There's a donate feature. You might consider making a donation if you would like to support our work. If you live in Metro Manila, Philippines, and are looking for a high school, you might consider Restless Educational Center. Restless is located on, on Allen B Street, not far from the corner of P. Guevara and Wilson Street in San Juan, Metro Manila, Philippines. At Russellus, we specialize in helping young people who have had difficulty in the larger traditional high schools. We are more than a school, we are a warm, supportive community, and we strive to make uh, uh, the school day interesting for the students so they enjoy going to school and enjoy learning. And the website is restless.education, R-E-S-A-L-E-S-T. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.